This meeting is being recorded. Uh, okay, uh, introduction. So we'll go around the, the virtual room here. And so we're looking for a name, your agency. And because February is Great American Pie Month, I want to know your favorite pie. So let's start with uh, Donna and Becca, because you're first on my virtual screen. Um, hi, guys. I am, and gals. I am Becca Stinson. I'm the social services case manager for St. Vincent and Paul's Health Center. Um, favorite pie? <laughs> I'm not a sweets person at all. Well, it doesn't have to be a sweet pie. Could be shepherd's pie. Ooh, sweet potato pie. There, there you go. All right, I'm Donna Brundage and I do community outreach and write grants for St. Vincent's and I like key lime pie. Nice. Uh, Chrissy, Chrissy Carlson. Here I am trying to fly under the radar. Uh, <laughs> not feeling well today, but my, my favorite pie it would be mud pie. The more chocolate, fudginess the better yeah good answer sarah h oh uh, yep i'm sarah with uh, idaho housing and um i'm gonna go well uh, i think with donna the key lime is it's is the thing awesome karen at department of labor good morning my favorite is, unfortunately, my own homemade from scratch peach pie during the summertime. Awesome. Uh, Joelle? Joelle Goodman with <clears throat> Safe Start here in Coeur d'Alene. And my favorite pie is chicken pot pie. Nice. The old pot pies. Uh, good answer. Uh, Kathy? Hi, good morning, everyone. Kathy Albin, I am the director of North Idaho College's Adult Education Center. My favorite pie, hands down, is huckleberry pie. Yes. Awesome. Wendy? Uh, I am Wendy from Real Life Ministries Community Assistance, and uh, I like, it's called a white, white chocolate lemon truffle pie. Right. That's a mouthful. White it is. chocolate lemon truffle is. pie. Wow. Divine. Nice. Uh, Lisa Donaldson. Lisa Donaldson, case manager at Family Promise North Idaho, and I have yet to find a pie I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you could only have one more uh, piece of pie ever, ever. I can only bring it down to two, and the, I, I'm with Kathy, it's, or Karen, it's my own homemade stuff. My uh, pumpkin pie from scratch and my peach pie. Nice. Uh, the other Sarah H. Without, <laughs> without an H. <laughs> hey, everybody. This is Sarah from the Community Resource and Vision Center. And I hands down love pumpkin pie all year round. Nice. Shelby. Hi, I'm Shelby Walsh with United Way of North Idaho. <clears throat> My favorite pie is probably peach pie. Awesome. Christina. Hi, I'm Christina Feliciano with Idaho Business for Education. And I have to say coconut cream pie because I, I love you. summer. Yeah, coconut cream pie. Awesome. Louisa. Hello, I'm Louisa with North Idaho College Center for New Directions. And I think just a good old fashioned apple pie is what I'd say. Love it. Uh, Leslie. Good morning, Leslie from the Croc Center. I, I do like every pie, but if I only had one, I would choose my uh, bourbon pecan pie that I make. Ooh. Wow, this is making me hungry. I <laughs> know. <laughs> uh, Steven. Hello, this is Steven from Equus Workforce Solutions, and I kind of might echo somebody in saying all of the above. Um, but if I had to choose one thing, somebody just stole my thunder, it's a bourbon pecan pie. That's good. Awesome. Uh, Margarita. Hi, I'm Margarita, and I'm the um, student support case manager at NIC. I'm not really a pie person, but um, 
my daughter did make a um, pumpkin crisp in a cast iron um, pan, and that was delightful. Awesome. Carrie. Hi guys, this is Carrie from United Way, and I am a big fan of pumpkin pie all year round as well. Although when Chrissy said mud pie, my brain immediately went to like actual mud, like <laughs> kids mud spot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Margaret? Hi, good morning. I'm Margaret Saijon. Um, I work at the Coeur d'Alene Casino as a hospitality director, and I'm also serving on the board of United Way. Awesome. And your favorite pie? Oh, Huckleberry. Huckleberry. Awesome. And Myron? Morning. I'm uh, Myron. I'm on the faculty of WSU School of Medicine and teach preventive medicine to the community. And uh, my favorite, I would say, is pumpkin. Lots of pumpkin. Uh, Mr. Mark Tucker. Uh, Mark Tucker, United Way of North Idaho, and I'm tempted to say anything from Birdie's Pie Shop. If you've ever tried those, they're fantastic, especially their key lime, but I think my favorite is strawberry rhubarb. Ooh, good one. Did I miss anybody? Just oh, me. Kaylin and, Kaylin and Liz, I'm sorry. My, my virtual room, it kind of just rearranges itself every once in a while. Go ahead, Liz. Let's go, Liz, and then Kaylin. Okay, sure. I'm Liz Montgomery with um, Safe Start here in Coeur d'Alene, and um, any pie from Pie Hut in Sandpoint is to die for. Like, so good. Um, but I would choose coconut cream. Awesome. Kaylin. I'm Kaylin with Community Action Partnership, and I have to say this is really cruel cool because I'm trying not to eat sugar. Um, <laughs> But my favorite pie is blackberry cobbler, actually. But I'll eat blackberry pie, too. Cobbler. OK, OK. That's probably in the it's a, a cousin of, of the pie. So that's acceptable. Uh, did I miss anybody else in the introductions? So um, I guess my pie, do you guys remember the little pies? And I don't know if they still have them in the stores, but the little apple pies or, or cherry pies, the what, what were the name? Was it just pie or was there a, a name for those? Nobody fruit remembers. Pies. They're fruit pies. They used to sell them at Fran's. Yeah, uh, the yeah. Bread yeah. Stores. Yes, yes. Thank you. Those were fantastic. <laughs> Super healthy too, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Nothing but sugar. <laughs> sugar uh, and preservatives. <laughs> those were the best when I was a kid, though. Yeah, absolutely. Well, what a what a great turnout, um, and we've got a great uh, topic. Uh, you know, uh, housing. You know, the challenges with housing are 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 just becoming even more challenging than they were. Uh, so, looking forward to hearing some insights and resources that uh, Donna and Becca have um, uh, created or found. So, Donna and Becca, take it away. All right, well, so let me preface this by saying that, you know, for the last probably six, seven years, we've been kind of sitting in rooms full of people talking about how worried we are about housing and um, gosh, there's just no solutions. And so the University of Idaho was commissioned to do this in-depth housing report, which kind of verifies those feelings that this issue is a lot bigger than people that are not sitting in the legislature in Boise, having a whole lot of control about what was going to happen, which has now become the reality. So this study was completed so that, um, you know, local governments and, and concerned community members would have some kind of data, hard data, to be able to reach out to the legislature and, you know, our senators and our representatives and say, all right, this is our future if something doesn't change. So. I, I'm not going to read this report to you. I think it was distributed at one time. If somebody would like it, though, we can totally send this out to everybody. But the, Univer um, the University of Idaho did like a 33-page report on what's happening. And there's really no shocking data in here, except that when you see it in black and white and it's all condensed into one document, it's a little bit overwhelming and, and frankly, kind of depressing. Um, you know, just going through the key takeaways, uh, 
you know, some of the things are that um, people can't afford to live here. That's the bottom line. Like rent that cost a, a fair market value rent for an apartment was fifteen. I mean, a thousand dollars six months ago. It's now up as high as twenty five hundred dollars. And as we all know, the salaries haven't kept up with that. Um, Idaho has the state of Idaho has a 35,639 housing unit deficit. Kootenai County has 2,353 more people that need housing than we have housing to provide to them, even if they could afford it. Um, new construction has risen by 17.1% 17, 17, yeah, 17 in a year. Um, but the price has doubled from $100 a square foot to $200 a square foot. And the price of land is, has gone from 5,000 to 6,000 per acre to 20,000 to 30,000 per acre. So even if you could afford to buy a new house, you probably couldn't afford the land to put it on. Um, a cost of a small lot in downtown Coeur d'Alene is over $100,000 now. You're talking like an acre maybe. This, you know, and the and the long term effects of this are there's going to be a labor shortage, and the current residents are going to be the the next generation will probably have to leave the area to be able to um, afford to live here. I mean, because they can't afford to live here, to be able to afford to live in a place, they're going to have to leave the area. And the current residents, if they're going to be outpriced with their rent, you know, the non homeowners, they're going to be replaced by. Um, people that are buying land and housing here as a second house developers or um, vacation rentals, retired people or vacation rentals. So it's it's grim, the, the, the prognosis is grim. Um, the last page of this report, the conclusions is Kootenai County is one of the fastest growing counties in Idaho. Idaho is at the top of the list for fastest growing states not coincidentally, Kootenai County is ranked nationally as having the fastest increase in housing prices and rents within the last four years. The county is at a crossroads with regards to long-term character in the community. Failure to provide adequate and affordable housing will fundamentally reshape the community in ways unintended by community leaders and community stakeholders. And then there's, they did not make recommendations in terms of how to change the laws or how to change zoning. Those recommendations will come in a later report. And, you know, that's going to be like what people are armed with when they do reach out to their, to um, our representatives in Boise. So with that, um, it's kind of like, okay, so what can we do, right? What can, a, what, if, what can a group of people that are unempowered to change zoning laws and to change, you know, laws on, on rent caps, if, if that's the answer even, um, what can you do? So there are, there are local groups that have formed that are specific to the topic of housing. One of them that meets monthly is the Homeless Coalition, and um, that's Region 1 um, of Idaho. So that's the five county area. And we have a, 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 an in per, we have a hybrid meeting once a month and, and where it went to talking about what do we do to serve the homeless community? Now it's gone to talking about how do we help the Alice community stay housed and what resources are available in terms of, um, you know, rent supplements or getting deposit money together to get people into housing. Um, there is Region 1 Behavioral Health, which is also the five county area, has a housing subcommittee of which I'm co-chair. And we have done the same thing. We're like, what can we do? What difference can we make? So we've come up with a couple of different ideas. One of them is um, to try to make it less painful when you're looking for housing uh, for populations that are not, you know, they can't afford a realtor. Uh, they're the people that come in to see Becca. They're the people that go to Family Promise. They're the people that, you know, go to social service agencies primarily and, and, and need lists. So rather than everybody having their own independent siloed list, um, we were able to gather from a lot of different agencies, including 211, um, a list of the shelters, a list of transitional housing, a list of assisted living programs, a list of subsidized housing, a list of places that accept felons 
and we put it all in one Google Doc. So it's a, a living document. And if you know of a resource that's there, you can add it. If you know of a resource that's no longer there, you can take it off. Um, and I have a link to that if anybody would like access to it or if anybody, you know, once you have it, you have it for life. So it, as it gets updated, there's no need to like redistribute and you can just print it. And then that can be the link, you know, it, it can be printed and shared with, with clients that are coming to see you to, to ask for help. Um, we are going to have an event in July. We're going to call it a housing awareness kind of festival. And we've already booked um, City Park for July 9th. And that will be a tabling opportunity. And um, we'll have some speakers, but it's basically a resource event where, where we can publicize it, put it in the paper, put it on the radio, hang flyers around town, leave stuff at the library. So if people are lost and they don't know where to turn for help or they're on the verge of being evicted because they can't pay their rent, um, or they can't pay their electricity and they're, you know, if you lose your electricity, a lot of times you lose your housing. So we can publicize that and say, you know, not everybody knows to go to St. Vincent's for help. Not everybody knows to go to the Croc Center. Not everybody knows to go to Family Promise or, or go to this website or go here. And um, hopefully we can blanket it and promote it really well and then give people a day at least where they can come and do things. And with that, the only other thing I have to add is that right now there is a house bill which sailed through the house in uh, Boise. It's HB 422 and it adds um, deposits and lease rental fees to the existing law, which says that, you know, there can be no government control of how high rents can go. Well, this also stops the government from saying, all right, stop, charge, stop charging $40 for application fees when you have 120 applicants and you know you only have two units to rent because that's what's happening. People are, are desperate and they're paying $40 just to apply at multiple places and then um, they're, they don't get it and, and they don't lose the money. So it's a big profit thing for some unscrupulous landlords. And um, there was, you know, people were, con constituents were requesting that, hey, maybe the government should step in and stop this practice because it doesn't help anybody. Um, but it, it sailed through the house. If you want to have a voice in this matter, or if you support it, you know, capitalism, free market value, um, you know, the, the market supports the, the income. It's, you need to call Mary Sousa or whoever your state senator is before this goes to vote at the Senate and just at least tell them what your opinion is of this bill because it's taking a, a, a pretty dire situation and, and making it even harder for the average citizen that, you know, working and living here. So um, with that, I'm going to turn this over to Becca so she can go a little bit more in depth on exactly what she's going to be doing in July and what she does every day. Um, because not everybody, there's people in this help center building that don't understand what an access point is. You know, it's there's a lot of terminology that people don't understand and they don't understand what happens once you do apply for help through like IFHA and things like that. So that could take away. So St. Vincent Nepal is the main access point for region one. Um, we collaborated with IHFA and set this up where it's the, you guys probably know it as the Homeless Connect. Um, a lot of people on this call right now refer people into the Homeless Connect screening and assessment, and it's for tons of different resources, services, and housing programs that can assist individuals or families in their housing crisis. Um, but as the access point, um, like Donna said, we serve the five northern counties of Idaho, so our funding, anyone in those five northern counties is eligible for services. Um, but that's what we're doing at the event. We can take a little Chromebook and we can do the screening assessments with everyone there. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes to do one of those. And what it does is it puts them in the queue um, for the Homeless Connect uh, or for the access point for those programs. Um, so that, it, I mean, if they're, it, it gives them a score based off their risk level for repeated homelessness. Um, and then we pull based off of that score. So you're, uh, like the highest score you can get is 30. That means you've been homeless, you have a documented disability and you've been homeless for over two years or you've been homeless four times in the last three years. That's that score of 30. And then it looks at things, um, it gives like a, 
it prioritizes individuals and families. So if you're a veteran, those are the first individuals we pull off that list with that high score. If you're domestic violence, those individuals are next and then households with children, so on and so forth. Um, but that's what we'll be doing at the event is doing these screening assessments to make sure everyone's in the queue and has equal and fair access to housing opportunities and programs. Um, that being said, because we collaborate with so many different agencies and organizations in region one, um, we have resources. We work, uh, I work really closely with Sarah from our local IHFA office. Um, we refer a lot of individuals or we turn in applications for the emergency housing vouchers. Um, region one was allotted a certain number of those vouchers and anyone who's literally homeless or at risk can fill those out. We send them over to Sarah and then they process them, so on and so forth. But um, to be eligible for these programs um, that are out there, you have to do the screening and assessment. They have to be pulled from the queue. Um, it also makes them eligible for programs like HPRR, Homeless Prevention and Rapid Rehousing. Um, those are programs that can pay past due rents if you're experiencing, um, let's say, a COVID-related situation. We have CARES funding that can help with that. We have funding that can help with rents and deposits. Um, we have programs that even in special circumstances that offer landlord incentives. Um, for the duration of the time that you're covered under a lease, we can potentially assist with um, damage deposits. It protects you, or well, it protects the landlord essentially. It's to encourage them to rent um, to high-risk individuals like felons or um, people who have evictions on their record. It lets the landlord know that it's their situation's being I don't want to say monitored, but we do go in and do inspections once a month. Um, and again, we cover the damages for things like that. But um, at the event, it's going to not only put all that information out there, but we're going to be able to do the screening and assessments there on the night. And we do that here at the Help Center too, of course, uh, Monday through Friday, um, 8 to 2, if they can either schedule or they can come into the Help Center and we can get that taken care of. Um, I would also like to note that um, we do, so I don't know if you guys are familiar with a lot of, we work with a lot of landlords and local property management companies, and I don't know if you're familiar with the applications, but on a lot of them, it says, do you qualify for homeless set aside? Um, some of the property managements that we work with, a handful of them actually will call us and say, hey, is there anyone that you think meets the criteria for this unit? And then they work with us. They're also working as with the access point to pull these individuals off the list because they know they're um, high risk and that they need housing and that's their only option. So that I means the landlord essentially has the last say so they have to qualify through the property place, but they are reaching out to us to see if we know anyone who needs housing. Um, so it really benefits anyone who's at risk or who is literally homeless to come into the help center and get signed up for programs. Um, and I do work with a lot of you guys know our volume of clients right now is so high for a lot of different reasons, not literally, not just for homelessness, but it's also that time of year where people are the moratorium through utility assistance is about to end. So it can take about a week or so to get an appointment um, to come in, but we, we are getting all of those done. So if you refer people in, just Try to be a little patient. I'm only one person. <laughs> um, we do have a new case manager, thank God, um, who's going to be specifically trained to handle access point screening and assessment. So hopefully it gets a little more efficient um, through here. But yeah, there's tons of resources out there. Uh, like Donna said, the only problem is finding the affordable housing piece because 90% of these programs um, have certain parameters you have to follow. So you have to fall within a certain income bracket and the unit has to be fair market rent. Um, like she stated at the beginning of um, her speech, the fair market rent uh, six months ago was like 927 for a two bedroom apartment and now it's $2,500. Um, it's our job as case managers to find the loophole that qualifies you for the program. Obviously we can't pay $2,500 a month per unit, but um, housing is out there. Um, tax credit units, subsidized units. If you're dealing with clients who have mental health, we have access and resources for uh, housing like Trinity group homes, studios or group homes. Uh, we work a lot with 211, IHFA, Leslie at the Croc Center, um, Chrissy at Navigations. There's the resources and the housing is out there. It's, it's a time game. 
at this point though to find the affordable and now is the time of year where all that housing is going to start popping back up so it's really important if you have anyone you're working with to refer them into the access point so we can make sure they're in the queue Oh, awesome. Um, we've got a lot of uh, requests for the, the resource list that you mentioned, Donna. Um, so we'll make sure to get that link distributed to, to this team. But I'm curious, Donna, uh, if you've got that open and available, could, could, could we get a sneak peek of that? Um, yeah, maybe. <laughs> if I can find it. Here we go. Oh, look right. at that. So, yeah, it's... Um, it's a it's just a Google sheet. It's really simple and we kept it that way for a reason, but it's sorted by different types of housing. It has, you know, and if you have something and you can you want to update this, like you have an email you want to put on there or you want an email taken off, please do. But um, I mean it just it goes through shelters, transitional housing, subsidized, felon friendly. Um going through it all the way down. What we did is we actually got like over a hundred and over about 108 different programs on here to like con condense into one. And then we had, we assisted living programs are all on one sheet now. Felon friendly is all together unless it like fit in, into a, a priority category. And then we have all the property management um, companies where, you know, all of the, the standard ones, but there's some other ones too. We have stuff that, you know, goes down, not just in Coeur d'Alene, but the majority of this is in Coeur d'Alene. So yeah, I'd love this thing to like, you know, be a, a, a living, breathing document that people keep updating and, and putting more resources on here. And so far it's been distributed. It's been distributed to like the housing subcommittee. It's been distributed to region one. I've sent it out to the span group. We use it internally in here a lot because a lot of times some of the a lot of our visitors just come in because they need something like this. They need a list of apartments to call. So, um, and it is you know sometimes Google Sheets and Google Docs are a little bit funky. Like you'll share it and then you have to like you'll get a thing like they're asking permission. I can totally do that, or we can just um, share the web link that'll take you to the you know the website, and it should go directly to the document. But yeah, we'll make sure. Chris, can you just send that out like a, a di distribute to your whole list? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, and Donna, did I hear you correctly that if somebody has a resource that's not listed on here, that they can themselves go ahead and add that on? Yes, please. I want okay. I want everybody to use this. I don't want it to just be something that you know sits in a pile on a desk. I want it to, I want it to be accurate and I want it to be current and I want it to be consolidated into just housing. Great work. This is fantastic. Just to be able to, to gather it all and have one place is a home run. Uh, questions for Donna or Becca? Well, so really quick, the cool thing about this Google Doc list, you'll notice that a lot of them are the same ones that are on the IHFA affordable housing list. Um, a lot of these ones that are on here are not just the subsidizing tax credit. It's also updated shelter information. Um, yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's <laughs> okay, so that's the point. Sorry, that's the, that's <laughs> the point of sharing it is because everyone has access to resources that we do not. We don't. We don't want to be the only one sharing housing information or giving these resources out just because it's so important to get all these people into housing. Um, you guys may have an opportunity that we don't know about. So if you have any updates, please, please add it to this list. And feel fair and feel free to share this as well. This isn't like something, I mean, it was created to be used. We don't have dibbies. Yeah. Questions for Donna or Becca? Just a lot of thanks, Donna and Becca. You are amazing. This is incredible work. I I feel pretty disconnected when I see this, just because even though I've, I've only been out of the Center for New Direction work for a year, yes, my is. gosh, this past year has brought a lot of changes. I know that the topic of housing is being talked about at the Coeur d'Alene Planning Commission. I wondered if anybody had an update on um, kind of this, these past couple um, planning commission um, meetings. Um, so that's one ask that I have. I also was curious to know, Sarah, what the um, wait list is for low-income housing for Section 8. Um, yeah, so, otherwise, yeah. can you kind of give an update on that? Yeah, for a preferenced person, and a preferenced person would be someone where, you know, 
where the household is, you know, um, elderly, disabled, or a family. Right now, I think it's at like 12 months, which is unreal. It's awesome. That's great. I mean, I haven't seen it that low ever. I've seen it as high as five years, but right now it's just, just right about the 12 month mark. And Kathy, what was your first question again? Because it's a little muffled. I didn't quite hear it. Well, beyond just thanking both of you and Becca for your tremendous amount of work and, and developing something like this, I wondered about the Idaho um, Commission, or sorry, the Coeur d'Alene um, Planning Commission meetings. I know that that has been a topic of conversation, both for open comment um, and just kind of talking about some housing, both for homeless, as well as I think a topic was brought up at the Planning Commission this last week on um, and my own children fall into this category of not being able to afford housing here. And my son leaves in June uh, with my granddaughter. So this is near and dear to my heart because they cannot live here. And I know that the planning commission in Coeur d'Alene has been talking about this. I wondered if anybody, I haven't been in attendance of those planning um, commission meetings. I wondered if anybody on this call has, and if anybody has anything to report on that. Well, there is a group, Kiki Miller runs a group called the Regional Housing and I think it's Development or Housing and Planning Commission, and she meets monthly, um, and it's kind of it's kind of invitation only. It's a Zoom call. I do go to that meeting. This is where this housing study, the idea originated. Maggie Lyons um, was key in getting this housing study together, and um, there is information about what happens at those meetings. It used to be um, KMPO.org, I believe it might be .com. But I think that they have switched over to a new um, website that lists yeah, that's like the one, Donna. That's the one that I put in the chat a little while ago. It's oh, rhdip.com, okay. and that does have um, agendas and meeting minutes. And then a, the FAQ is really thorough, um, so that section probably answers a lot of it too. Yeah, and it's. I mean, like I said, this is where the whole re the study got started the whole concept of it um maggie worked with this group and got this going so it's like um kiki has ideas about what we can do for i mean she's got a subcommittee right now working on housing for employees of kootenai county and um it, it gets updated on the website that's the best way to get information or you know you wait a month and then you go to the meeting and hear the updates so um I think that's like probably one of the, the most key groups politically in terms of making real change and having a voice. What was so, the name of the group? It's the, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong. It's the Regional um, Housing and Growth. Yep. Issues something. Partnership. <laughs> partnership. There you go. Yeah. It's a bit of a mouthful. Even the acronym is a bit of a mouthful. <laughs> So I just, I have one more question just for anybody on this call. Um, I, I was the recipient when Maggie sent out the um, University of Idaho housing, uh, the, this document. Um, are there some suggestions on who to share this with uh, within our own sphere of influence and how they want this to get out and what can we be doing as, you know, as individuals in our space to help communicate this out? I, I feel like I, I'm not certain where well, to share this. It, it's a it's a very public report. The link to it has even been shared, I believe, in the press in the CDA press. Um, so yeah, we welcome to share it with anyone and everyone that has any kind of a you know any kind of a stakeholder shareholder in either owning a business that needs employees or having a family that needs to be able to afford an apartment or, you know, it, it's like, it's kind of like, it's, it's such a shared problem within the community. The more community members that are educated and informed, the better. Yeah. Right. And I so, think there is a plan, an outreach plan to give like a 15, 20 minute presentation to chambers and rotaries and organizations. And they have a lot of those scheduled already. So I would say, you know, if, if you know of anybody that may have any interest or influence or is affected by um, the housing market itself, obviously everybody's impacted by the cost of it, but anybody that has influence on the trajectory of it, then go ahead and share it with them. 
other than that, just keep it in the back of your mind when you hear it come up, say, hey, did you know about this? Yeah, so I also just wanted to share that there has been a group of us on the North Idaho College campus for years who have tried to kind of form ad hoc committees to talk about because we also often have parents that are calling with um, out of the, the area to try and get places for, you know, students to live and it's been a huge topic and none of us have really felt individually like we could take that on. Um, we opened up conversation again this past week and one of the recommendations was um, to create a, a site or a, a resource on the NIC site. Um, I'm going to drop in an example that came. Um, this is something that Whitworth put out for campus housing. And I'm wondering if any of you might be willing to share some information as we move forward in developing something similar to this. So that is the Whitworth site. It's, it seems pretty general to me, um, but I feel like all of you may have ideas in just what Donna and Becca reported out about all these. And again, this terminology is so new and, and raw for me. I don't understand like some of the housing pieces and the access, access point. Um, Becca, and I, you know, again, I used to call you out of sheer desperation um, just because I didn't know where to start. But I'm asking any or all of you on this call to help maybe give ideas of how NIC can develop something similar to what Whitworth has done here to provide resources and things to, um, you know, students looking for housing. Um, so I know that's overwhelming and I kind of hijacked for a minute, but I, I want to make sure that NIC is doing all we can to help with this. Awesome. Thank you, Kathy. That's great, great stuff. Uh, anything other general shares uh, on the topic of housing? I saw in the chat, um, Stephen asked about the short-term rentals uh, like Airbnb, and that is definitely something that comes up quite a bit in those meetings. And, you know, they're, they're trying to figure out how to manage that, you know, with the, the tax income that the city gets versus the property owner's rights. And um, it's a, a challenging situation, um, but it's certainly a topic that comes up a lot. I don't know of any solutions that have been come up with yet. Okay, um, so yes, the those links were shared in the chat. We'll also make sure those get distributed uh, to the group and those that could not attend today. So let's uh, let's switch gears and 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 switch to our, our roundtable discussion. So. Those of you that may be new to our conversations, we do a, a roundtable just to share uh, valuable resources uh, in your area that uh, maybe are, have always been there or, or are new or just general updates from your agency. Or also we like to share uh, challenges and successes as well. So, um, and this is kind of just a, a whoever wants to, to begin and, and just share and, um, yeah, it's um, who who would like to kick it off. I will. Okay, Lisa, we'll do so, uh, Lisa, and then I saw a hand up from Kaylin, so we'll go Kaylin next. All right, I'm Lisa from Family Promise of North Idaho, and um, both of the families we've had in the program uh, left our program this week. One of them is a graduation, thanks to Becca and her program, and um, super excited about that. We don't get graduations as much as we used to, so it's always pretty big celebration right now. Um, bringing a new family into the program today and do have one open spot. So if you have any families that are literally homeless and looking for shelter, you can have them give us a call at 208-777-4190. And we're also still doing our um, homeless prevention rental assistance program. And um, that one, you go through the website, which is familypromiseni.org. Thanks, Lisa. Kaylin, you're up. Thank you. Okay, so every three years, Community Action Partnership does a community needs assessment um, with the community members that we service, which is usually the lower 10% of, if you read the housing report that was um, linked in our comments, um, and it talked about uh, the population that's under that average, that's who we serve. And so um, 
obviously housing was a big issue with them as well. And so I'm gonna post our, our findings on the link as well so you can take a look at it. And even though the numbers show a little bit lower, keep in mind that our constituents, the ones that we're working with, they're in that lower bracket too. So they're sharing homes. So the cost of um, uh, rent is lower. They're doing lot rents instead of apartment rents. They're, they're on subsidized housing, all of that stuff. So that lowers that average. But even so, their their um, average cost of living is still their home is still in that fifty percent or above, which is posted in that um, that housing report as well. So they're in that struggling outlet where it's sixty two percent of their income is going towards rent, uh, and up to even ninety five percent. It's this one elderly man that I was talking to the other day. It's just not sustainable, and he has nowhere to go. So obviously housing is a big issue for everyone across the board. And you can kind of see how it affects um, that in terms of how it, it goes out into the other three um, points of, of issues that we're seeing in our report. So I'll post that now. Thank you. Who's up? This is Karen at Department of Labor, I'll go. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for sharing all this wonderful information today. I will be sure to pass all the information along to all of the folks in our office. Um, I have a challenge um, for you all. I think as we're all really aware, in addition to the, the housing issue, um, we have a shortage of labor in our communities. Um, one of the ways that we can try to help, um, because I work in the WIOA youth program, um, ages 16 to 24, out of school whether they've graduated or dropped out, doesn't really matter if they need to be out of school. We are trying to set up apprenticeships, on the job trainings, um, work experiences for the younger ones, whatever we can do to help get workers into the employers. Um, they are, the employers are very on board. We've spoken to many employers in the area. They're very willing to take on the youth that we have or that we can find. They're willing to take them on the challenge is they're not coming through the door. We're having difficulty getting them in here to, to make them eligible for the program so that we can do for the employers what we're wanting to do. So in your personal life, we all know um, kids of this age range, um, you know, in each of your businesses and what you do every day, we're all exposed to individuals that may qualify for our program. Please send them our way we will do what we can to make them fit and make them eligible and get some workforce out into our community, help those employers out. I, I would like to piggyback on Karen because we work in the same office um, and it has to do with the WEO program as well. Also the dislocate, we, we manage at Equus the dislocated worker and adults and it's the exact same comments I'm hearing from businesses. They are willing to work with on the job training. Um, we just, they just need the participants to come forward. So if any of you have um, individuals in your organizations that either need a step up in occupation or are searching, send them our way uh, to Karen or just come down to the Department of Labor office. And we love to work with them to try to hook them up to some of these businesses that are, they're desperate. Awesome, thanks Stephen. I'm gonna piggyback off that. Uh, we get to finally host a job fair again at Real Life. And so April 13th from 10 a.m to 1 p.m. Uh, Department of Labor is having their job fair at Real Life. And I think we're shooting to have at least 70 employers here this, this year. Um, can I ask a question uh, from Wendy at Real Life? Are you guys, is, is Department of Labor providing the employers? So if I have a lead on an employer, can I get them to you or to by DOL? So if you have a, an employer that wants to do a booth, uh, contact Department of Labor. Uh, they they schedule all the booths. We just uh, provide the space and stuff. So. What was the date, Wendy? Uh, April 13th. 
Okay, well, I'll, I'll keep talking. <laughs> Thank you so much, Wendy. I am uh, Christina Feliciano with Idaho Business for Education. Um, I am the Business Development and Program Manager for the Youth Apprenticeship Program. I am serving Regions 1 and 2, um, and I hear housing in both Regions 1 and 2 is pretty much the same. And it seems to be the largest conversation that I have with all of my employers that I've been trying to help set up registered apprenticeships with. Um, my job is to facilitate the conversation and help them get connected to resources, both the employers, the parents, the students, and for the employer, help them build that talent pipeline and create the registered apprenticeships. I often work with Karen at the Idaho Department of Labor and whenever we have the opportunity to braid funds because I have supportive service funds. If the individual is in a registered apprenticeship program and enrolled into my program, I do not have very much that they need to have to be enrolled into Idaho Business for Education's Youth Apprenticeship Program. They have to be an Idaho resident, resident authorized to work in the United States and between the ages of 16 and 24. I can serve in school, out of school youth. I don't have to prove barriers. I don't have to prove low income. We're just there to connect the student or the individual, young adult, to employment opportunities within our community. Now, that being said, we also need to connect to the employers and I don't have registered apprenticeships in all areas. Recently, I got asked for anything with animals and I'll be quite honest, I don't have a vet tech, I don't have farm, I don't have anything with animals at this time. The only thing that's in remotely close in our area would be Petco. They have their own apprenticeship program as a groomer. Um, but my goal would be trying to connect those employers that do have registered apprenticeship opportunities or want to create them and get them connected with our, our clientele, you know, because we do all serve pretty much the same clientele um, in this room or virtual room. Thank you, Christina. Thank you. Who's next? Hey, Chris, I don't mind going next. Um, this is Sarah from the Community Resource and Vision Center. I just wanted to give a big shout out again to Donna and Becca from St. Vincent de Paul. This is like the most helpful information ever, especially to us here in Sandpoint, because I feel like the housing here is just non-existent, period. Um, that's one of the biggest calls that we get is for housing. And uh, thankfully to all these wonderful resources, we we're able to kind of direct people. But I think the housing wait list here is almost like low income housing is two to three years. I mean, it's just astronomical, um, you know, so we also don't have a shelter here either. So we do kind of rely heavily on St. Vincent de Paul and get to getting people down there. Um, so I'm going to scan over that list. And if there's anything that I can add from this area, I will definitely do that. And uh, yeah, I just wanted to share with you guys a little bit too about some things that we've got going on. So we are doing our in-person spin meetings next week from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. Um, we're doing Zoom and in-person. It's gonna be on mental wellness and we'll have speakers from NAMI. We've got speakers from um, Connexio Community Health. And I wanna say Bonner General as well. And I just think this is a pretty viable topic right now, especially with everything going on in the world. Um, so that'll be a pretty big one for us. And then we're going to try and start, um, get the ball rolling on, I want to say in Coeur d'Alene, it's called, let me check. I don't, it's, I don't think it's Charity Tracker. I want to say it's Charity Reimagined. And I know that you guys use that a lot in Coeur d'Alene. And so I think we're going to start rolling that out here in Sandpoint to try and kind of facilitate um, how we can better be better providers for the people in our area. Um, and so, and I want to say that we've got one more thing, um, and that's just kind of wanna end, wanted to emphasize the life skill classes again that we're going to have here for our clients and anybody that you know that has any kind of needs. So it'll be on, you know, job readiness, parenting, things like that. We've got four personal computers here, and we want to just continue um, trying to assist people in being self-sufficient and getting back on their feet and just preparing them for those life choices that they need to make. So thanks. Thanks, Sarah. And I think that's a, that's a good point as well as when each of you has a chance to really look into the list that uh, Donna and her team have created, be thinking of 
uh, all the, the five Northern counties. And if you have a resource from that lens, then that would be great to add to that list as well. So excellent point. Uh, others, other updates? You can go directly from the croc. Okay, we'll go Leslie, Liz, and then Louisa. Okay, thank you. Leslie from the Croc Center. Um, I wanted to chime in. It is Charity Tracker um, that you were speaking about. Glad to hear that uh, Sandpoint's looking into getting on board with that. We're getting ready to transition over to that from uh, Charity Check. And um, we're getting some training from Charity Reimagine to do that. Um, just just to remind everybody, the well meets every Thursday evening. So if you have um, neighbors that you're serving that can really benefit from a small community of people that will cheer them on, help them establish a SMART goal, and then ask them every week how they're doing in reaching that SMART goal, as well as um, help them just get some education on wellness and exercise, that is what the well does every Thursday night. We have a couple of doctors who are working with us. And so um, each person that comes can even have a great conversation with the doctor. They're wanting to build relationship and really serve uh, the people that come into the well. No membership required, it's free and children are welcome too. Um, and then I wanted to just uh, mention that we're doing our Families Feeding Families food drive. It'll end on Monday, Valentine's Day, and we are focusing on impacting people who are experiencing homelessness. And so we'll be getting those boxes to agencies like the amazing St. Vincent de Paul, who will be able to get those boxes of non-perishable food items um, in the hands of people who really need them. And we're gearing up for camp. It's spring break at the end of March. So we'll have crop camp for, um, for kids who are um, oh, four, let's see, well, spring break. So it'd be ages six to uh, 14. If you need a scholarship, we have those available too at the front desk. And that's it for the crop. Thanks, Leslie. You're Liz. welcome. Sure. So um, my name is Liz. I'm the executive director of Safe Start. Um, just a couple resources for the five northern counties um, are we have um, online Zoom classes for safe infant sleep, car seat safety, child infant CPR and first aid. And we just added a new class series this year. It's a childbirth class. Um, it's, um, everything is free. Every people can just register on our website, safestartnw.org. Um, any family who takes our safe sleep class, um, we mail them a sleep sack, which is a wearable blanket. Um, if they need a port, a new crib for their baby, um, they just take that class and then we will ship it to them. Or if they're close by, we can, um, they can come to the office here on fourth street and pick it up. If families need a car seat, this includes booster seats. Um, we're the busiest check station in Idaho. In fact, we did over 25% of the car seat checks for the whole state last year. So we have a team of 13 technicians. Um, we're working. Um, so if families need a car seat um, booster, just get on our website, safestartnw.org. You'll see our phone number at the bottom. You can call, um, you can email us um, to set those appointments. So um, yeah, we have a lot of resources. Um, we are working on a rural outreach education project this year. So we have a new trailer that um, we're going to be headed to Bonners Ferry, Sandpoint, um, Clark Fork. We're going to head down to St. Mary's this year again. So we're going to be taking our safe start program on the road this year. So I'm just trying to reach those families that, you know, don't have the transportation to get to Coeur d'Alene. So, um, we also have our healing together. So grief support for pregnancy, infant, and child loss. It's not counseling, but we can refer to, um, area counselors. Um, but just supporting, we have eight support events every year that, um, including an online social hour, 
um, for families. So if you would like me to drop off brochures or rack cards so you can hand those out to families, um, we're happy to drop those off or just mail them out. Media mail is super cheap these days, so it's great. <laughs> happy to do that. So just let us know how we can help for your families with kiddos and babies. Okay. That's awesome. Awesome. Thank yeah. you, Liz. Louisa. Hi, um, my name is Louisa. I am a new employee at NIC working in the Center for New Direction. So I first just wanted to introduce myself. Um, I see Kathy Alvin is on Zoom right now and she um, had been in this position and then there was someone else in the position briefly and then there was a gap for a while where there was no one in this position. So I kind of want to reintroduce what Center for New Directions is and how I can offer assistance to people within the community. Um, so on campus, I serve single parents, displaced homemakers, and career pioneers. And so a displaced homeworker would be someone who maybe is wanting to go back to school after a divorce, and they need to learn some new skills in order to find employment. And then a career pioneer would be, an example of that would be a female who is interested in welding or diesel technology. Um, and so someone who is training in a field that's traditionally held by the opposite gender. So I, um, I'm really excited about this position. I don't, they don't have to be NIC students for me to help serve them and help them with any barriers they might be facing in their life, whether personal or school-wise or employment-wise. Um, and I could just connect them with different resources and help them through their time at NIC. Um, or if they're interested in becoming student, a student or trying to just do some career planning or resume building, I can help them with that, whether they, or not they're NIC students. Um, so that's kind of my position. So if you know someone who might be interested in becoming a student, please reach out to me. I'd love to help. Um, and then also, I just want to thank everyone on this call. This has been very cool for me to be a part of this. I feel like this is a Zoom meeting full of helpers. All the helpers within the Coeur d'Alene community are here together right now. I think you all are the ones doing the work and it's really cool and inspiring. So I'm glad to be a part of it. Yeah, well, we're happy that you're part of it. And this group keeps growing and expanding. It's fun to see the, the returning faces and the new faces. So um, we are coming up at the hour. So if you didn't get a chance to, to share an update or a resource or a challenge, send that my way and I'll make sure it gets um, relayed out to the group. Uh, I would like to, end, so we, we, heard, we heard a win from Lisa at Family Promise. I would like to end with, with another just general win, with that, whatever that may be. But any, does anybody have a win that they want to share for, for the past month? I will. Thanks, Mark. Uh, so we have a, a new employee here, Shelby Walsh, who is on this call, and she has experience in special education at the elementary school level, and she is our new early learning coordinator. And uh, she has been trying to absorb all the information that Carrie Cedarquist and Idaho AEYC can throw at her. Um, so we're just happy to have her here and look forward to the progress our early learning collaborative can make in the coming year. Fantastic. That's a huge win. Uh, awesome. Again, we'll get these resources out, out to everybody. If you didn't get a chance to get your update in today, send that my direction. I appreciate all of you and your investment in this group and the community. So uh, Mark, any, any final mentions or thoughts? We can, we nope. can excuse everybody. Awesome. Right at 10 o'clock. All right. Thanks all, I appreciate you. Thanks everybody, have a great day.